put on the screen. Okay, welcome everybody. It's nice to see at least some faces in person here. And we have uh, many people online. And as I said, the lectures of physics 5419 and 9419, which is the PhD variant, uh, they, the lectures will be both in person, but then if you cannot be here in person, they will always be available via Zoom and all lectures will be recorded. So the uh, uh, thing which I wanted to give you first, and this is something which you probably already have seen. This is the uh, official website of the uh, University of Oslo for this specific course. And uh, there you will find information about the teaching schedule. And one thing for those of you who uh, may not have taken courses here before, you can actually subscribe to these activities. So that means that in case there are changes of lecture halls or changes of schedule or whatever, you will get a warning via text or an email, depending on, on your preferences. But here roughly you will see the plans for the semester, but you will also see that after the Easter break, uh, there are many to be uh, announced. So this depends a little bit on you guys' plans and wishes and thoughts and so on. And I will say a little bit more about that. So this is about the practicalities, some of the practicalities. If you scroll down, you will see that we use Canvas. That's the way I will typically communicate with you. You will get an email, a weekly email. Uh, you hopefully saw you got one today. And this type of information will also be displayed here on the official website on the plans for this week. So that you will see much of the same information which uh, uh, you got through an email. And you will also find a similar announcement in Canvas. And typically what I will do is to send a weekly email with updates and plans for the week to come, with reading suggestions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, everything which we will uh, deal with is actually at uh, the uh, GitHub address. So if you click on that link, you will get uh, access to all the lecture notes, materials, plans, et cetera, et cetera. So if we take a look into that site, this is what it looks like. And uh, you will find some uh, textbooks, uh, which uh, I will try to uh, not exactly follow, but I will extract some reading assignments from these textbooks or reading suggestions. And there's one by Wolfgang Scherer, which is uh, freely available if you're on a university IP address. So you can download all the Springer texts from that. So this is a textbook where you can access the PDF variant to the ebook. There's also a pretty good one for, uh, so since this course actually has a kind of, uh, tries to strike a kind of compromise between uh, programming, uh, quantum computing itself and quantum machine learning. It has also uh, a non-negligible computational element. And uh, there is a textbook by Robert Hunt, which is actually pretty decent. There is a new version which is coming up. You can also access that one electronically via the subscription of the university. So you can actually download that one. And uh, if you search, you will obviously find the PDF file somewhere. The, um, uh, you will find a typical overview of the different weeks. So the kind of uh, uh, thing we want to do today is actually that we have a short presentation of each other uh, or come with the uh, kind of wishes, background, etc. And then uh, we, uh, uh, I want actually to bring back some basic definitions. So today's lectures is not going to be the most exciting one, but it's also meant to set the scene and figure out where you guys are and uh, what is your background. So typically this is a course which has a very heterogeneous group of uh, participants. So we've been having people from computer science who have no quantum mechanics background. So we have people from mathematics who may be pretty savvy with the mathematical formalism, but uh, are less familiar with the physicist way of describing things. And then we have physicists and quantum chemists. This is the typical uh, audience for this course here. So that means that we are, we've been having last year, we had people with no background in quantum mechanics at all, but they were pretty savvy with linear algebra. 
because linear algebra is actually the language we will speak. And today is in a certain sense, a, perhaps a slightly boring exercise in linear algebra or repeat of many things with links to uh, the interpretations and the overarching themes which we will try to cover. And uh, uh, you will see that there are things which uh, we, some of the things are things which you may have encountered in previous courses. Uh, the emphasis here is going to be on actually simulating quantum mechanical systems on quantum computers. Right? This is going to be the uh, first rough outline of uh, what we will do. And uh, that means that uh, some familiarity with the quantum mechanical uh, eigenvalue problems and quantum mechanical many particle physics uh, is something which we will try to describe throughout the semester. Then in the second half of the semester, uh, what we normally have done is to uh, open up for more, how to say, different paths. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, this has actually been a self-study course where people will come with their wishes and they, we would typically design projects according to their research plans and interests. Uh, but since there are quite many people and we have Today, we have 11 people online and some few people in person due to the weather. Uh, we uh, uh, will have to uh, ask those people online to actually come uh, with uh, some kind of, or just send me an email with your interest, your background, and uh, what kind of uh, topics you're interested in. So after the lectures, if everybody could actually send me a short email with your background, uh, whom you are, uh, which study program you're following, and what are your interests in this course. And uh, the uh, idea is then that we will try to uh, shape the project so that they follow more or less your scientific interests. That's the kind of idea, the ideal. And uh, uh, also because this has been a, a self-study course, actually. The emphasis, uh, the first half of the semester will actually be on how we simulate quantum mechanical systems on a quantum computer. And uh, the second half of the semester, depending on your interests, we can design a project which goes more into the direction of quantum machine learning. Alternatively, we can refine the quantum simulation part and study explicit implementations of algorithms on actual quantum computers. So we have a lot of flexibility here. And we would like to keep that kind of flexibility. The lectures will follow a specific path and that path will actually have a heavy emphasis on the actual implementation of quantum algorithms in special, in particular algorithms for simulating quantum mechanical systems and how we implement this on a quantum computer. So last year we had a project on a kind of idealized Hamiltonian system which has been very popular in physics, which has the, uh, which offers uh, numerical solutions to or numerically exact solutions. And in some cases you can even diagonalize a simple matrix. So you have analytical results. And that system was a system which we implemented with a famous algorithm, which is called the variational quantum eigensolver. And we implemented that one on our normal computer and some people actually implemented it on uh, IBM's uh, machines. And nowadays we have actually access to the IBM five qubit machine. And this is something which we will discuss later in the semester. So the, the uh, broad focus is on implementing quantum mechanical algorithms on quantum computers with the uh, aim to simulate quantum mechanical systems. So that means systems of interacting particles. And then we have the quantum machine learning part at the end. This means that we will cover topics, uh, theoretical topics like density matrices. We need to make measurements and extract the values which we want. There will be a discussion obviously of entanglement on entropy as a way to uh, study entanglement. We will uh, discuss other things like uh, setup of quantum gates and quantum circuits for actually making uh, simulations. Uh, quantum Fourier transforms are not 
something which is limited to uh, solving quantum mechanical problems, these enters algorithms like Shaw's algorithm and other popular quantum mechanical algorithms. And then uh, there is a somewhat focus on algorithms for solving quantum mechanical problems. But here again, depending on your interests, we can obviously uh, design other types of algorithms. They don't need to be the solution of quantum mechanical problems. This could be actually studies of algorithms like Shaw's algorithm. And people did that as well last year. So I wish to have this kind of flexibility. And that's why I would like to have some feedback from you, where you are, where your interests are, and so on. So after the lectures, if you could just send me an email, and this is also applies for you guys online, if you could just shoot me an email with a, a short description of why you're interested in this course. And then obviously, depending on this kind of inputs, you will see that, that after the Easter break, there are lots of uh, slots with TBA. And last year, we actually had a group of people who were interested in uh, studying quantum machine learning. And we did that with uh, a, a machine learning algorithm for neural networks, which is called Boltzmann machines, which are very easy to, uh, or I shouldn't say easy, but they are easier to implement on with classical algorithms, and they are slightly more complicated when it comes to quantum machine learning algorithms. But uh, this is something which we can discuss as, a, as we move on in the semester. So feel free all the time to come with feedback here, because we can always adjust the course of the course. Okay, so the, um, if you then, uh, just as another practicality, if you click on a doc folder here, you will uh, find uh, there is a pub folder for public public uh, available material. It's just a name I cooked up. And if you click on the typical week, uh, you will find a format which uh, the format which you can choose. You can have either the PDF format if you prefer that. There is a Jupyter notebook of the same notes, and there are also different HTML formats if you prefer that. So this is very much up to you what kind of format you prefer. Uh, in the lectures today, I'm going to use very much the PDF file, but the content is exactly the same. But in many cases, we will also run codes, and then uh, we will develop our own codes, but we will also run Qiskit, which is a popular quantum computing library. And I guess that many of you may have heard of Qiskit as a library. So that's a very popular library. It's, you can download it, and it, uh, it's written in Python. It's, it's Python-based. So, and it, you can run basically all the Python codes you're familiar with and implement Qiskit together with that. Uh, you will also find examples of textbooks. And here, uh, there are some uh, textbooks which are freely available. And you can see you have Scherer's book here. Uh, there is the uh, textbook by Maria Schult on uh, quantum machine learning. So one of the things when you write uh, this feedback to me or just send me this email later, uh, I I'm also interested in knowing whether you've taken any course in machine learning and how familiar you are with machine learning techniques like neural networks and deep learning techniques. So that's something which is also be very useful. You will also find there's a, actually a pretty nice textbook here on the basic math for quantum computing. So this has been actually made freely available by the authors. And you can take a look at uh, some of them. There's actually a nice book on entanglement as well. And there are several other textbooks as well. So if you come across textbooks which are which you find interesting and relevant for the course, please uh, share that information with uh, your fellow students and me as well. So anyway, uh, I don't know how familiar. I assume in a way that everybody, I guess everybody, is familiar with the version control software like Git, and then repositories like GitLab, GitHub, etc. So in your case now, what you can do is actually, if you click on code here, you can actually clone the whole repository and have that on your laptops or your PCs and use it as you want. And clearly if you spot errors and so on, and there have to be error because I happen to be a human and humans make errors. So please do flag them to me and I will correct things as up. Any questions so far from you in, in here in the classroom and those of you online? For those of you online, you can either unmute yourself or put questions in the chat. And I will try to follow the chat channel as well. Okay, sounds good, eh? 
So what I want to do now is actually bring up the uh, the slides for this week. So I promised you that it's going to be a little bit boring because I will just go through some reminders on linear algebra. But then I will also jump a little bit back and forth between my whiteboard, which is my iPad, and uh, the slides as well. Because there are some figures and so on, which I normally like to make on the iPad. Okay, so let me just switch on here and uh, share screen again. And let me just find it. Here we have it. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, today we are going to revisit some of the mathematical notation which we're going to need. Uh, some of it is pretty obvious and some of it may be less obvious. And uh, we're also going to look at specific quantum systems and in particular so-called one qubit systems. And uh, I actually wanted to uh, spend some time on that one because uh, I want to link that to real physical systems and how we can actually extract and idealize this uh, computational basis which will be defined by qubits. So I'm going to use a word like computational basis quite a lot. And the computational basis can be states which you can observe experimentally. And this is actually the way they are realized experimentally. And these states can be single particle states or they can actually be many particle states. And often when an experimentalist is looking at the candidate systems for making this type of quantum simulations, they are looking at well-defined states which can be manipulated with, for instance, lasers. And if you look at two low-lying states, you could say that the first state is state zero, and that is identified as qubit zero. And the second state, which could be the first excited state of the system, would then be qubit one or state one. And then you're hoping that the other states do not influence much the system. So for some of the quantum mechanical uh, or the quantum computers which have been realized, actually the admixtures from other states can actually ruin the whole quantum computation. And we've seen that when we've been running some specific algorithms where you are expected to get answers like 50%, you never get that, especially if many people are running on a given quantum computer because thermal excitations may actually ruin the computational basis. So to control the computational basis and have a very clear and sharply and well-defined computational basis is essential for the actual realization. So when we are actually discussing many of the mathematical aspects, one tends to forget that real life, this in real life, these states are complicated many particle states and they are under the influence of the environment. There are thermal excitations, which actually can spoil the computational basis. So this is uh, what I'm mentioning now is actually an interesting path for the second project, because we had people who were more interested in, in actual devising quantum simulations on actual systems. So this is something which can be done in this course, actually. So uh, as I said here, the course is defined as a self-study course. Uh, I will try to have weekly exercise, weekly uh, lectures. And uh, I haven't defined yet the first project. And that's because I rely on feedback from you guys. Because then we can design it. And there will be some small weekly exercises every week, which uh, complement what I will be talking about. And then are also relevant for you building up uh, the code for the first project. We will also try to keep this as a kind of active learning environment where we will switch between project work and exercise work and some lectures. So that means that you will get the teaching material uh, before we actually have the lectures. And my hope is that everybody has the time to skim through it so we can spend more time on actual work and project work. So that's the kind of ideal. Uh, so we are planning two projects and the first one uh, has been more, how to say, quantum computing based and simulation of quantum mechanical model systems. 
And uh, people have uh, last, like last year, there were people who continue with this first topic to more realistic systems. Uh, as you've seen on the website, the uh, we have two projects and each count uh, each counts fifty percent. However, if it's natural that the second project is an extension of the first, then you can just hand in one project, which includes both of that. So suppose you want to run simulations, uh, quantum simulation of specific quantum mechanical systems in the first project, and then you would like to continue that and study more realistic systems in the second one, you could think of the first one as a kind of warm-up a theoretical project, which then leads to this final results, which may be more interesting. Or you can think of this as two different projects. This is also fully possible. So we want to have this kind of flexibility. And uh, the tentative deadline is actually March 22 for the first one, which is be right before the Easter break. And then the last one is uh, uh, June 1st, there is no exam here. So that means it's only the projects which matter. And you can collaborate with people. It's uh, very useful to do that. So if you find uh, partners to work with, then feel free to do that. And you learn much more from that. So uh, two to three people are often ideal. One may be mathematically savvy. The other one may be a computational wizard. And then you have somebody like me who is an expert in making good coffee and cracking lame jokes. You need partners like that in a project as well. Okay. So that was for the first lame joke you will suffer this semester. So let's see, there's a there's a question in here. Uh, oh yeah, the questions can be clearly be finished remotely. There's no problem with that. So if you, if you uh, would like to be in a lovely place like Tahiti, then you can do everything from there. That's fully possible. So everything can be done remotely. Okay. Uh, obviously, there is something you miss when you don't have the in-person communication, but that's uh, very much up to you. I also wanted to say another thing. So the projects uh, will typically be uh, something you will hand in uh, in the form of a scientific report. So that gives you also training to write it like a scientific report with an abstract introduction, et cetera, et cetera. And in that connection, uh, and I assume that uh, everybody has heard about ChatGPT, this is actually a tool I really, how to say, uh, advise you to use because it's extremely useful. Uh, the uh, thing you should consider, because there's a lot about, about uncertainty about using these tools. Uh, people have been uh, blamed for plagiarism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The way you can use it, suppose you're writing an introduction to the first project and you want to find the right words. This is often something which, uh, the way I would do that when I, uh, and I still do it the old fashioned way, I spend a lot of time on the introduction because then I read all the papers. And that gives me often new ideas for new things. But then when I read these papers, I often find nice wordings, which I like. So I am not a native English speaker, and it takes time to actually write English phrases. And then I find a wording and I like it, and then I just adopt it, right? But then I cite the paper. The way you would use ChatGPT in the same way, because you can think of ChatGPT as a kind of body, right? You could ask questions, and every time you ask the questions, you will get a different answer. So what you can do then, if you use ChatGPT to help you as a body in writing, let's say, the introduction, then you can just print out the extracts from the ChatGPT conversations, and you could link that in the report. This is what I used, and then we can see how you used it when we read your introduction. So when you use it, and I advise you to use it because it's a very useful tool, it's also an extremely useful tool because for people who cannot be here physically and cannot interact with us personally, this is a fantastic way to actually lower that threshold for interacting, even if this is a, uh, how to say, a non-human. But for people actually who have, uh, who have, who are hindered for coming here, 
this is actually something which can be a useful tool. It doesn't replace the human one-to-one -one conversation, but it uh, it's a very useful tool if you don't have the time to be here. So there's another one. Uh, uh, one prefers Haiti. Okay. <laughs> Do you have office hours? Yes. I. So please just send for office hours. Just send me an email. So I normally like to have every day uh, just open, just swing by. But in case I'm not there, uh, feel free to uh, either send me a text or my my cell phone is this one, so you can see it here. And then just send me a text in case you want to, or just send me an email. And then we can always set up either a Zoom session or just meet in person. That's very much up to you guys. Okay, so that was a, uh, how to say, kind of lengthy introduction. So what I want to do now is just to say a little bit about notations. And I hope you don't get offended if uh, you're seeing some kind of pretty standard linear algebra again. So I will uh, basically have a kind of notation where vectors, matrices, and high order tensors. So uh, a three dimensional matrix is a tensor. Matrix is actually a two dimensional tensor, etc. And they will be bold faced. And with vectors, which we will use quite a lot, I'm going to use lowercase letters. And uh, uh, unless otherwise stated, uh, the uh, oh sorry, the, the elements of the vector assume to be real or complex. So there should be complex here as well. So it could be a real vector, and if we have a complex vector, we have a, a, an, an, a vector of length n. And for a matrix, if this is a real matrix, uh, it will be an n times n matrix. And what you will see is that basically the matrices which we will encounter here. These are square matrices. And that has to do with the fact that we need to deal with unitary operations. And then the matrices are basically square matrices. So the, um, the ordering which I will use is actually starting with a, a row-wise ordering. And it starts with element zero. And this is because if you write things in Python or C++ or Julia, then the Python arrays start by default with element zero. So these are just some additional mathematical notations, which you probably have seen before. And uh, uh, there are many other ones, which I will introduce as we move on. So just quickly, uh, a vector. And later, I'm going to change this notation here to the Dirac notation. And this just comes a little bit afterwards when we have gone through some basic notation here. And uh, we will define the transpose. And then we have the Hermitian conjugate, which is given by this symbol here. And you will often just uh, hear me say just the conjugate or the transpose. And normally, when we are, since we are going to deal with the Hermitian matrices, and we are going to deal with unitary operations, that means that uh, Everything which we deal with when we look at the transpose is the Hermitian conjugate. I will come back to the definition of that one. We have the inner product, which is in case we have a real vector is given by the transpose times x, and that's just a number. Later, we will redefine this. So this is just a, uh, uh, just a, some wording, uh, kind of uh, notions about uh, wordings during the lectures. So sometimes I get lazy and I don't say Hermitian conjugate. And I often just say the transpose or just the conjugate. But of what I mean then is actually the Hermitian conjugate. Just keep that in mind. So sometimes we just get a little bit sloppy in the language, but from the context, it should be pretty clear that we are thinking of the Hermitian conjugate. And unitarity, as you will see below, plays a central role in this course. And I will come back to the basic definitions here. Now, there is a question about the inner product here. So the, the inner product which you have here is actually, uh, it's given by this form here. It's actually the transpose times x. And uh, that is just the sum of all these elements and it's just a constant. And uh, in the case of a, of a vector which is uh, not uh, complex, you actually just have x here. But in case you have a quantum mechanical object, as you will see later, this will have to be the 
Hermitian conjugate. Uh, still, if we have uh, real elements, uh, this is the outer product, and that's going to play a central role here. We will see this again and again. And later, we will rewrite this in terms of uh, Dirac, Brian, Kett notation. And then you will see that this is going to be written in a slightly different way. So in this case, we are assuming that the elements are real. So this defines also the typical matrix layout, which is going to look like this. So that means that uh, we would have a, if this is a square matrix, uh, we would start with the element zero, zero, and you can often rewrite this in terms of column vectors where A zero here is actually this column vector. And it contains these elements you see here and the same with A one, et cetera, et cetera. And then clearly, if you have the inverse of a square, square matrix, if it exists, then uh, this is defined uh, like this. And we will come back to the way it looks like when we have a so-called matrix, which is a emission matrix. And if that exists, then we will have to be a little bit careful here because this will be the emission conjugate, which is multiplied with a matrix. And you can see that here. So these are basics on basic matrix relations. And our objects will, uh, to a large extent, be uh, uh, objects defined by emission matrices. And the unitarity, as I said, is going to play a very important role. So these are some basic uh, matrix features. And feel free to actually revisit some linear algebra text and, and just take a look at it. And then uh, we have some famous matrices, which we will encounter now and then. I just leave this so you can take a look at it because the thing which is a little bit more interesting for us are actually some statements here. So uh, if the inverse of a matrix exists, the matrix is non-singular. These are all equivalent statements. And one thing which we will actually uh, use a little bit later when we are looking at uh, entropy and entanglement uh, we are going to look at something which is called a Schmidt decomposition. And then we are going to need something which is called the singular value decomposition of a matrix. That is something you can do on a matrix irrespective of whether it's singular or not. If the matrix is not singular, you can actually rewrite the matrix as a product of some simpler matrices. Are you familiar with that? Has anybody encountered that? Anyone who remembers, there's a famous decomposition theorem for a matrix which is non-singular, a square matrix. So, it's, so let's see if some people online remember that. Now, actually, the uh, the uh, if you, if you you should try to write out the. Uh, so the when you when you look at the inner product, you should you should write it out as the transpose times the the vector that gives you the inner product. The uh, outer product is the vector times the transpose of the vector. Okay, so if you look at uh, the uh, uh, this uh, elementary matrices, does anyone remember some of these? So you, you, you're, you're close to it. So if you think of, uh, uh, you have matrices which are called lower triangular and upper triangular. So you can actually decompose this in the product of a lower triangular matrix where you have uh, uh, zero elements above the uh, diagonal and the lower or the upper triangular is a matrix with zero values below the diagonal. So you can actually rewrite a matrix in terms of that if you can invert it. However, you will have, can, we can have cases where the matrix cannot be inverted, or where the determinant doesn't exist, or the matrix is singular, but then you can use what's called a singular value decomposition. And that is often used in calculations of the uh, 
the uh, so-called Schmidt decomposition, which we'll, we will come back to. Then there are some basic operations here. Uh, I'm just going to leave them so you can take a look at these uh, 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 definitions here. So what I'm going to do now is to actually uh, bring in the quantum mechanical definition. And this is the kind of notation which I will use again and again here. So if you look back at the vector here, where you have the vector x, and then uh, if you look at the quantum, the way I'm going to define this quantum mechanically, I'm going to redefine this in terms of the uh, Dirac bracket notation. So in case you're not too familiar with that notation, it actually means this, what is written here. So we will actually, uh, throughout the course, we're actually going to look at this specific notation. And that means that the, uh, uh, what I call the transpose is actually here, the Hermitian conjugate is given by this vector here. And we will now take in the complex, the conjugation of the other vector. Okay. So these are just notations which uh, uh, we are going to use throughout the semester. So when you see this notation here, this simply means that you can retranslate it in that term. So that means that the inner product now is actually given by this number, the summation here. And if you have two arbitrary vectors, uh, this is actually given two arbitrary vectors x and y, it will be given by this sum here. And uh, if you are uh, interested uh, in that textbook by Hunt, which I mentioned at the beginning, you will find basically all these definitions again. So in the first chapter there, the, uh, the author covers many of these definitions of quantum mechanical uh, quantities like the inner product, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the inner product is always real. While if you have two different vectors, it is in general not equal. So if you take the transpose of y or the emission conjugate of y times x, this is not necessarily equal to that one. And you will see that in the next example. Uh, also, uh, bypassing, there is some additional notation here, which uh, uh, it's worth uh, remembering. So when we write it like this, this stands for the emission conjugate and the same here. So these are just some notations which uh, uh, you probably have seen before. And you can see that if you take a vector which looks like this, which has a imaginary i here, then if you take the inner product of that one, you see that it is a real number. But then if I take uh, two such vectors, what I end up with then, if I have this vector x, which you see here, this one, and then you take the vector y, then you will see that if you take x times y or y times x, you get different results. And that leads to a very important rule, which you see at the bottom here. And you've probably seen this in quantum mechanics courses before. Just let me know if this is unfamiliar or if, I guess everybody is familiar with this kind of notation. And uh, you can use the norm or the inner product to, to actually normalize the vector x. And that's something which we will assume with most basis sets, which we have, that these are so-called ortho, orthogonal and normalized basis sets. And we normally call them for orthonormal basis sets. So the outer product is uh, something which we will use again and again, especially when we are looking at measurements and when we are looking at the so-called projection operators. So a projection operator is going to be used to define the whole Hilbert space for a basis set. And then we define that in terms of the outer products. And the outer product here is now given by this relation, this operation here. And that gives us this matrix, which you have here. And now we, from now and on, we just deal with uh, essentially uh, complex quantities. So there are uh, some matrices, which many of you probably have encountered, which are the famous Pauli matrices or the so-called XYC matrices. 
And uh, the thing you will see, the reason why I bring this up as early as possible, is that we are going to rewrite quantum mechanical Hamiltonians in terms of these Pauli matrices. So that implies a set of transformations. The, the Hamiltonian system, which we studied last year, which is called the Lipkin model, that model can actually be rewritten immediately in terms of Pauli matrices. And some of you have probably encountered spin models like the Easing model, the Heisenberg model, etc. And these are models which where the Hamiltonian of the system is already written in terms of Pauli X, Y, and C matrices. There are important reasons for this. Uh, when we are going to simulate a system and uh, write a quantum circuit, we will try to rephrase a quantum circuit and the operations on the system in terms of the Pauli matrices. The thing which becomes important then is a matrix like the Pauli C matrix. So the last one here, because this one is a matrix which has as eigen vectors and eigenstates, the uh, qubit zero and the qubit one states. And you will see that uh, quickly now. And uh, this is something which is going to play a very important role uh, for us in the coming here. So the poly, the poly Z matrix, the last one here, is going to play actually a very central role in measurements and the setup of quantum circuits. And you will see that quickly, why this matrix is so important. So these matrix are, have some uh, commutation relations as well. And also we know that uh, when they square them, this gives us back the identity matrix. And that is also very, very important when we are looking at quantum operations. So I hope this is not too boring, but I'm bringing back some of these definitions because they uh, are quantities and uh, quantities and objects which we will use repeatedly here. And then uh, they have a famous commutation relations. And uh, what I wanted to do now is actually to go into a definition of computational basis, because that's going to play a very important role here. And uh, before we take a break, uh, what I'm going to start with is actually a kind of two level system. And these states could actually be represent some selected or effective degrees of freedom. You could have a single particle system, or they could actually be many particle uh, states. So this could be the eigenstates of a system like atomic neon, where you could have the ground state and you have the first excited state. And hopefully the other excited states are far away in energy and they are pretty discrete, which means that we can make operations with lasers without interfering too much with other states. And we are going to look at uh, these specific states and we're going to look at specific systems. And we are going to look at these states as our computational basis states. And I will come back to why this is so important. And this is actually not limited to quantum computing. This is something you would use in any quantum mechanical, many body and few body uh, machinery. You would always have a computational basis, which could be something which represents the solution of parts of the Hamiltonian system which can actually be solved analytically, for instance. And then you could use that basis, which would be a complete basis. If you think of like the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, that has an infinite of uh, set of solutions and the states are orthogonal to each other and they can easily be normalized. So that means that we have a basis and when we have such a complete basis, we can expand any function in that basis. And this is something which we will come back to again and again and again. So the wordings of computational basis is something which you will hear more and more about. And the simplest possible one before we now take a break is normally what we call a two, one qubit system, where you could now think of a specific state here, which we label as zero. So that's just a labeling. And that state looks like this vector, one zero. And you see immediately that these two vectors here, which have length, these vectors, which have length two, they are orthogonal to each other. Because if you try to take the inner product of one and zero, 
you will get zero. And you see that immediately, but we will look at this in more detail after the break. Now, this doesn't need to be a single particle system. This could actually be a money particle system where this corresponds to the two lowest lying states. And when we do quantum computing, we're actually looking for systems when we want to realize these systems experimentally, we're actually looking for experimental systems which display distinct states, which we can think of computational basis states. So is it okay if we take a small break now? And uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm gonna put the recording on pause. So one of what we what I would like to do now is to uh, bring back a little bit of these more abstract uh, descriptions which we have to uh, specific quantum mechanical systems which you may have encountered before. And uh, a very simple one which I mentioned is the possibility to just have two states, and these states could represent the states of a single particle, or they could be many body states. And what we are doing now is that we are singling out two specific states. And we are assuming now that we can describe them in this specific way. And it's easy to see that these two are orthogonal to each other. So what we are going to do now is simply to switch uh, to the whiteboard and try to make a link with uh, something which you may have seen before. So let's uh, look at the uh, a famous quantum mechanical system, which probably many of you have encountered in basic quantum mechanical courses. So what we could do now is to just introduce again the harmonic oscillator. And for the sake of simplicity, we could now think of introducing this one just in one dimension. So this is a one dimensional system. And what I'm going to do now is to present the Hamiltonian for this system, which is now a scaled Hamiltonian where we've gotten rid of all the natural constants. So that means that we've taken away the mass, we scaled it away. So we are dealing with a dimensionless Hamiltonian here. And in that case, I'm going to define a Hamiltonian H0, which now depends on X in one dimension. So we're assuming that X goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this Hamiltonian is now given by the kinetic energy, minus a half. And then I have a D, the second derivative, D of X, and then plus, and then a potential energy part, where we have some scaled constants, K here, which multiplied with X squared is also something which now is dimensionless. So we've just scaled away some of the const, physical constant. So this is a standard harmonic oscillator. Now in the, this specific case, what we have now is that we have as eigenstates for this specific system. So let's call this uh, phi of n of x. We know that we have eigenvalues uh, which can be represented by a very simple analytical expression. So in one dimension, this epsilon of n is simply equal to n plus one half. That's the energy. So these are scaled energies now. So quantities like the oscillator frequency and the uh, constant h bar are now being scaled away. So this is a dimensionless energy in order just to simplify things. So we know that this phi of n's of x here they are given by polynomials, which are called Hermit polynomials. And there is a factor of e to the minus one half of x squared. So these are the solutions to these uh, quantities. And we know then that uh, if I take the inner product of uh, psi of n, and if I write it like this now, of psi of m, this is the same as an integral over d of x, from minus infinity to plus of infinity of psi n of x complex conjugate of psi m of x. And we have defined this to be an orthonormal and normalized basis. So this is given by the Kronecker delta of n and m. 
So we have assumed now that this is on so-called O and B basis. So phi of N is A and O and B orthogonal and normalized basis. B for basis. So this wording orthogonal, normalized basis. So in principle, this basis has an, in this, uh, the solutions to the harmonic oscillator problem has an infinity of states. And when we now plot them, we would have the state N0, which has an energy in this specific case, which is equal to a half. And then we have the next state with N equal to one. And that has an energy, which is equal to three half because there's a spacing of one here. And this just goes on like this. With an E equal to five half. And this goes in principle to infinity. Now, the problem here, when we are dealing with a money body system, is obviously that we can now actually make a linear combination of states, which involve this harmonic oscillator states. The problem then, if we have an infinity of single particle states, then we will get an infinity of many body states based on these single particle states. And that clearly becomes an intractable quantum mechanical problem. That's normally referred to the uh, curse of dimensionality in many body physics. So what is pretty common to do then is actually to make truncations. This is something you will do in quantum computing, but you will also do that in standard money body physics or quantum chemistry for those of you who, are more, who come from a quantum chemistry environment. So typically there will be a truncation here. So you will have a limited basis. Now, experimentally, these uh, uh, systems uh, are systems where we would like to identify some specific low lying states. So we could now make it this truncation. We could actually push this down even further and we could actually put it here. And then we could now just define two states. So we could define this state and this state as our system. That becomes an effective system because we have now defined some effective degrees of freedom of what in principle is a system with an infinity of single particle states. So we define then an effective space and what we could say now is that this effective uh, space contains now two single particle states. So this could be single particle states you could now think of this being one electron which sits here, or you could have an electron which is here. But it could also be a money body system. Then what we would say now is that this state which we have here, this one state or zero state is phi zero, is something which we will label with a zero. And then we could take the next state here and we could say that this phi one is something which we will label with a one here. So this is now an effective space, a truncated Hilbert space. So when an experimentalist is looking after candidate system for making quantum circuits and quantum gates, they're often targeting uh, systems, complex systems in for material science, in semiconductor physics, etc., which display some explicit low lying states which then can be manipulated. So what we are saying now is that these states one and zero, they define our computational basis. So our computational basis here now is now composed of zero and one.
But keep in mind that this is a truncation which we have made. The original computational basis is the solution of the harmonic oscillator problem. And that contains an infinity of states. So you could now say that the original computational basis is actually this basis which you see here. And that has an infinity of states. But clearly dealing with infinities is something which we don't want to do because every computation we do is on a, is on a normal quantum computer or even a quantum computer, which will always have to deal with the limitations of having a discrete set of numbers which can be represented. But in principle, when we are trying to look after real uh, or idealizations of uh, physical systems, we are trying to find low-lying states of a system which have specific properties, which we will come back to, which we then can use as computational basis states. So if we now look at these two states, which we have singled out, we could now say that the first state, so this is just a choice we are making, is now given by this vector here of length two. And then we have the second one, which is just zero and one. And now you see that if we take the inner product of these two here, this is the same as zero one multiplied with one zero. And we see that this is exactly equal to zero. And then if we now take the other one, if we just take zero, zero, then you see that this is automatically given by one. And the same applies also with one, one. That gives us also one here. Now, if we now assume that our Hilbert space contains only these two states, then we have a complete basis, and then we can expand a new state in terms of that basis. So in general, with a, an orthonormal and normalized basis, with an O and B, what we can do then is actually to redefine a new state. So let's call this C of I. This can be written out as a linear combination of all the other states which we have defined in the orthonormal basis. So this summation runs over J, which is this new base, this basis we have defined as our computational basis. And this contains some coefficients, which are so-called overlap coefficients. And that would contain now the basis phi of J here. Uh, in this specific example, with only two states, what we would have then is a state like psi, let's call this psi zero. So that could be written out like a psi C zero zero multiplied with the state zero, which is the same as this phi zero plus a C zero one of the state one. So we would then have a linear combination of these two possible states here. So we can always use this orthonormal basis, which is now a solution to a specific Hamiltonian. We can use that one to expand a specific other state in terms of that basis. I guess you're pretty familiar with these kind of uh, uh, manipulations of basis sets. This becomes very important when we are going to look at measurements a little bit later here. So we would have a state psi zero. And when we are going to make a measurement on this psi zero, then the measurement will force the system to collapse to either zero or one. Now, in order to make these measurements, I'm going to introduce some other quantities, and these are called projection operators. So let's just bring that back again in the slides uh, after this uh, small intermezzo here. So let's go back to the, uh, to the slides. And now I have to find my slides again. I have too many windows up here. So the, I need to find that one. So let me, just a moment here. Okay. Sometimes when I use the, okay, let me just bring it up again. 
There we are. So when you now look at the, what we had here, this basis states, which we set off here, zero and one, then what we can define now is the completeness relation, which is given by the outer product of these two states. So the completeness relation is then simply the sum over the outer products of all these states. So if I take the first one, which is one zero, then that give, gives me a matrix which just has one here and zero on the other diagonal. And then the other state, the zero one, gives me a matrix which has zero in the first diagonal element and one below. And when I sum it up, you see that this gives back the identity matrix or the unit matrix. That's the correct name. And then that means that we can define projection operators of this type, which you see here. So this state here is actually going to, or this projection operator P is going to be an operator which now projects out the first state. And Q is going to project out the second state. So these become very important quantities when we later are going to define what we mean by a measurement. So there's one thing which is also important to note is that these operators, when I square them, they are equal to themselves. And you can see that easily when you take the operator P here and you square this matrix, it's just gonna be equal to one and zero along the diagonals and zero else. So these are important properties of these projection operators that P squared or the operator squared is equal to itself. And it's also easy to see that when you take now these two matrices, so I leave these as small exercises to you guys. When you take these operators, you can easily see now that if you want to set up the commutator, that these two operators actually commute. So keep in mind now that when I say operators, since we have introduced this linear algebra way of representing everything, then these operators will be given by specific matrices. And you can see that if you look at this matrix, if we now go back to the whiteboard, if you take the, uh, so let's do that. If you take this matrix P or this projection matrix P and we act on that. So if we now take the operator P, which is given by one, zero, zero. And if I act on this state, psi zero, which is the same as acting on C00 zero zero of zero plus C01 zero one of one. What we have then is that we have a matrix one zero zero. And this is now multiplied with this constant C00, zero zero, which is just the overlap between the basis psi and the basis phi. So what we have then is just this vector one zero plus C01 multiplied with a vector 0, 1. And when you multiply this matrix with uh, these two vectors, what we get then is simply C00 with 1, 0. So that means that we are projecting out a specific component of this linear combination of uh, computational basis states. So this is simply C00 multiplied with 0. So P projects out a specific component of this state psi zero given by the computational basis zero and one. So we call these projection operators simply because they actually project out a specific component 
of this computational basis, multiplied with a constant which then represents the overlap between this new state, psi zero, and the computational basis. So just remember now that this uh, uh, coefficient c zero zero is simply just the overlap between psi zero and zero, and this coefficient c zero one is then the overlap between this psi zero, which we defined, and this state one. So in some cases, you can actually calculate these overlaps. Remember also that these overlaps are in principle uh, sums over specific components or just integrals. So if we have a continuous uh, wave function, this would simply be just an integral over d of x, and then I would have this psi zero of x complex conjugate multiply with this phi zero of x. Okay. I hope it doesn't sound too trivial what we're doing now. So I'm going back to the uh, to the slides. So let's do that. So it's easy, pretty easy to see that when you set up these relations here, this p and q are also equal to zero, the commutation relation. And as we said, just to repeat a little bit, we would call this a superposition of the states. And we can expand a new state in terms of these states here. And these states could also form a basis, which is an eigenbasis of a selected Hamiltonian. Now, if you go back to this harmonic oscillator, which we discussed, now this harmonic oscillator could be something which we could single out from a full Hamiltonian of a system. It means that the Hamiltonian of the system could contain something which looks like a harmonic oscillator plus some more complicated parts. So that means that this computational basis we have chosen is not a solution to the full problem. However, a solution to the full problem then for the full Hamiltonian could actually be this state Psi here. So we are coming back to this. Often when we are dealing with the quantum mechanical interacting systems, we try to split out a part to which we can find an analytical solution or in numerical terms, a solution which can be solved numerically in an easy way. So the harmonic oscillator, if we can rewrite our Hamiltonian in terms of kinetic energy, plus something which looks like a harmonic oscillator, plus perhaps some interaction piece, then we can use the harmonic oscillator as a computational basis for the full money particle system. So this is something which is often done in many body physics. So you try to find a computational basis, which is simple or where you have analytical solutions to. That would be not the full solution to the interacting case, but you can expand the exact solution in terms of this computational basis. And these are manipulations which we will keep doing here. So you could think now that uh, zero and one these two states are the solutions to a part of the Hamiltonian. And then we could try to find the exact solution, Psi, as a linear combination of these two here. And then depending on the type of uh, formalism which we have, we would then find the recipe for finding alpha and beta. These are things we will come back to again and again and again. So if we compute the inner product of this state, then we find obviously that this is equal to alpha squared plus beta squared. And since these two guys are normalized, so that means that zero and one are normalized, then the sum of these has to be equal to one. And we will come back to that. I will prove that it's proven later in the slides here, that if we perform a unitary transformation of our basis, then the norm will be preserved and the orthogonality will be preserved. So what you see here is just another statement of you making a unitary transformation. So you can think of these alpha and beta as elements of a unitary matrix, which transforms you from one basis to another one. So just to show you that, if we just move on a little bit, I have put up some examples a little bit later here. So let me just go through that because then you can easily see that the unitary transformation keeps the norm and the orthogonality. So if you have a basis like this, so this is a given vector as we discussed, 
And then you assume that the basis is orthogonal. That means that we obey this relation here. And now I'm assuming that this is a real vector. If it's a complex one, I will take the Hermitian conjugate here. Then I make a unitary transformation where I have this unitary matrix, which transforms the old basis to the new basis. And when I then use the properties of uh, orthogonal or unitary matrices, then I know that this operation here is the same as ut times u. And these two guys here multiplied with each other have to give the identity matrix. And then you see now that this is a simple demonstration of the fact that when you perform an orthogonal or a unitary transformation, then if the states are already normalized, you keep the normalization and you keep the orthogonality. So that's a very important aspect of unitary and orthogonal transformations. So when we say orthogonal transformations, we normally think of a matrix or a vector which is real. In our case, we are dealing with unitary matrices. So this is a complex matrix and a complex vector. So I'm just going to go back a little bit to some more definitions here. So the reason for why this has to be equal to one is simply due to the fact that we have performed a unitary transformation. So you can see this derivation here a little bit later in the slides, the one I showed you now. And then clearly these things are the same things which we put on, this, on, the, on the whiteboard. So if I act on this state phi here with this projection operator P, I project out one component and the same here, I project out the one component here. Here the zero component and here I have the, the vector number one or qubit one. So I will sloppily call this for qubit zero and qubit ones. Or you can just think it of state zero and state one. So experimentally again, you can actually find such states in a complex uh, semiconductor or a material. And then you can think of making manipulations with these states. Another quantity which we are going to define and use a lot is the so-called density matrix, which is now defined as the outer product of the state which you see here. So you can define that in terms of a specific state. If I were to use just zero and zero, that will give me a matrix which has one and zero along the diagonals. And you see now that if I do that, I would simply have to use this linear combination. So I'm getting this quantity here. And another quantity which is very important for us is the trace of this matrix, which is the sum of the diagonal elements. And the trace of this matrix for this orthogonal and normalized basis has to be equal to one. So keep in mind now that I define the density matrix in terms of just one of these states. Now we are going to use this quantity a lot, especially when we come to the definitions of entropy and we are going to study entanglement in many body systems. That is going to play a very important role. So right now, I'm just bringing it up as a definition. But we are going to use this a lot. So there are some other important matrices which we are going to uh, use again and again because they can define quantum gates. So when we are going to run our simulations and build a quantum circuit, they can be represented mathematically by these operators which you see here. And one of these is the so-called Hadamard matrix. If you now look at this one acting on the state zero, this makes now a superposition of two states. So we started with the state zero here, and we end up with a linear combination of zero and one. So we actually creating a superposition by operating with this specific matrix. So later, we are going to see how this specific matrix here can be realized experimentally. So many of the experimental operations which we are dealing with are operations which we are now translating into specific matrices. So what we are saying then is that we have a superposition of the states zero and one. There's another famous matrix, uh, which is called the phase matrix, which we are coming back to. 
And uh, now I'm just mentioning many of these quantities because we will be using them repeatedly. Another thing which we need to be a little bit careful with, and uh, this is uh, becomes important because we often tend to use a kind of shorthand notation. And that shorthand notation, so I'm gonna use some time on it now because that shorthand notation confuses us. It makes life easier, but it can also confuse us. Because when we now have uh, two states here, when we take the tensor product of these two states, these are states of vectors with length two, then we actually get a new vector of length four. So the tensor product of these two vectors is the result which you see here. And we normally would just write it like x1 here, xy, instead of just this corny notation here. So let me uh, bring back another example, which uh, uh, you probably have seen in different physics courses. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to switch back to the whiteboard. And this is an example of a tensor product, which is compactified in just a very uh, shortened type of notation. And sometimes it's, uh, it gives us a much, much easier way to present the formalism. But at the same time, we tend then to forget that actually what we are dealing with is a quantity like this. So let's take a closer look at it with something which you may have seen before. So let's go back to that. So if we now take this uh, harmonic oscillator case, which we had, so let's just write it down here. So what we had is a set of states like this, where we now can put n equal to zero. We have n equal to one, n equal to n equal three, and in principle, we have an infinity of states. So here we associate this one with a state, psi zero of x. And we would typically write this now as a vector, which we just call phi zero. So as a vector, this is actually given now by a, a vector of a specific length. So if this is discretized, so assume now that we have discretized it, in principle, x is a continuous variable. But suppose now we have discretized x. So that means that we would have phi zero of x1, oh, sorry, x0, there will be phi zero of x1. And this would go up to all the values of x, which we have to xn minus one, like that, okay? So this is the way uh, we would typically run a calculation because we cannot represent infinities in a computer. So we would typically discretize the value of x in a set of discretized points, x0, x1, et cetera. And that means that the state phi zero, which we have now is given by this vector. Now, suppose now that these states are fermions represent, let's say an electron, which is trapped in a harmonic oscillator. If these are electrons now, what we could have, we could have an electron with spin up in that state. So we would typically indicate that with a spin up. It has actually a spin equal to a half, and it has a spin projection, which for the value of spin up, we would put it plus one half. But then we can also accommodate an electron with a spin down. So we would then have a spin down here, which means that we have the spin projection equal to minus one half. So when you now look at the, the way we would now build the state, because now we cannot use this phi zero again, because phi zero represents only the spatial degrees of freedom. But we would like to now represent the state for this specific electron, which you see here, for, with the spatial degrees of freedom and the spin degrees of freedom. Now the spin degrees of freedom, if we look at them, they could now be represented by these spinos, one zero, and zero one, right? So that means that when I'm now writing up the state, or let's say we want to describe this specific particle. 
So what I would have now would be a state which has this n equal to zero, and it has spin equal to a half, and it has spin projection equal to one half. So I would like to write this in a very compact way. So I could now define this state, which I'm gonna call psi zero of x. And I want to write this in a compact way with n equals zero, s equal one half, and ms equal one half. So I could write this out now as zero, one half, one half. In more general terms, what I would have is a phi psi of n of x, which is now simply given by n, s, and ms. So this is my compact notation. But what this actually is, is a tensor product of two states. So this quantity here, if we look at that one, this is actually a tensor product of these phi zero of x zero, phi zero of x one, and all the way down to phi zero of x n minus one. Actually, I should use m here because this is the discretized integration points. And this has now a tensor product with this state one zero. So that means that what I should do now is actually to multiply every such component with this guy here. However, when we are now are compressing everything in order to actually present something in a human, uh, how to say, compactified way, we would typically use this notation or the more general like that. But keep in mind then that this actually represents a tensor product like that. Okay. So I'm just bringing up this because sometimes we tend to forget that what we are dealing with when we write these compact expressions for quantum mechanical states is that we do actually have a much more uh, involved type of equation here. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, to the slides and then we're going to set up the last thing today. And I think I, so let me just go back to that one. Escape it. Okay, let me just bring. There we are. Sometimes I get lost with all this. I should have less windows when I. So just keep this in mind. And you would then see that if we take two qubits, and this is the last thing we're going to say today, if you look at two qubits, uh, we would then have a state like zero, zero here, which is the uh, tensor product of one, zero, one, zero. And that gives us this new state with length four. And we would often write this as a zero, zero. Or if we're getting even more lazy or we want to compactify it more, we will simply label this a state zero. So what you could think of is that these two guys here, they now point to different states. So you can think of this as an address in memory, which then points to specific quantum numbers, which then identifies totally the system. So this is a computational way of thinking when you're looking at these states. So you would then see that these are typical representations which we are going to deal with. And next week, we're actually going to introduce a simple Hamiltonian in terms of Pauli uh, matrices where we actually are going to look at one qubit states and two qubit states. And you can repeat this with three qubits and more qubits. And this is where we will actually stop today. And uh, there's actually a little bit more information here about tensor product of matrices. So I invite you to take a look at these slides uh, and I will also send you an update. And please send me an email with your preferences, uh, what are your expectations about the course? What is your background? Because that will help me when we are going to design the projects. And I will send you an update and uh, some reading suggestions for next week as well. I hope it wasn't too boring because these are just some basic uh, notations which we are gonna carry with us through the rest of the course.